He came specific. He was the atonement. He took upon himself. He had to, he had to remember on this past Friday, you know, we shared how, how Jesus says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me for the very first time? God the Father had to turn away because of what, what he, what was being, the sins of the world that was being placed upon Jesus. The holy, the sovereign God couldn't, couldn't look at all of the ugliness of sin. Hi, my name's Angel Falcon and I'm honored to be uh, before you here today. We believe that there's no greater responsibility entrusted to us as believers uh, to give you, teach you the Word of God. I trust that you will be richly blessed by what you're about to hear. Remember that as we increase in the knowledge of God's Word, His blessings are sure to fall upon us. Trust you will be blessed. I love how even nature blesses this day with the sunshine breaking through the clouds. Isn't that awesome? Hallelujah. The Universal Church of the Lord Jesus Christ rejoices today globally around the world in every urban city, in every byway, in every rural point. There are people gathering, thanking God for who He is and what He has done. Most of us know the story. But there's so much more sometimes that we don't that we don't fully see but I want to just glimpse a few things about the magnitude of what this day represents I want to encourage you because Jesus' resurrection brings us hope I want you to understand that he came so that we may have life and yet have it more abundantly and so this is just not a religious experience for me. This is a, this is, a, it, it, it drives my breathing, hallelujah, of, of what he did. In Luke chapter 24, we see, uh, I love how the gospel just gives us little glimpses as to what took place on that first day. That's why Christianity, you know, doesn't, don't, don't, um, uh, doesn't follow the Sabbath anymore because we believe that Jesus broke that on the first day. So we celebrate our Sabbath is on, on Sunday because it was on the first day that Jesus resurrected. And so I want to read to you just a few scripture verses from the, the Gospel of Luke on the 21st, 24th chapter. And now on the first day of the week, Sunday, said somebody say Sunday. Very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb to bring spices which they had prepared. Traditionally, it's something that it was traditionally done, uh, and actually they 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 started doing that back when they were enslaved in Egypt. They learned how to embalm and how to bring ointment and all kinds of stuff. And um and so they were preparing these things, and they noticed that they found the stone rolled away. Now, this stone is believed to have, you know, it's, it, it was big. It wasn't something that could be easily moved because they were fighting uh, grave robbers. So you needed a bunch of people to really move 
this stone. The stone is considered to be weighing over two tons. So that's 4,000 pounds of itself. Plus, we know that the religious leaders made sure, said, listen, he kept saying that in three days they were, he was going to raise up again, destroy this temple, and in three days, say three days, a lot happened in three days, let me tell you. And so uh, the beauty of this story is, is that so the, the religious leader told the Roman centurion that you need to put gods there because we don't want nobody to steal Jesus' body we don't want the disciples to come and steal his body and then tell him, he is risen, he is risen. So they staged, they put guards, Roman guards, on the tomb. But they noticed that the stone, they had just got there and the stone had been rolled away. And they went in and did not find the body of Jesus, of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, Two men stood by them in shining garments. And then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? For he is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you? When he was still in Galilee saying that the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day, say the third day, third day. be risen. And then they remembered his words and then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the 11, the apostles, and all of the rest of the disciples. And it was Mary Magdalene, Joanne, Mary, the mother of James, and other women with them, who told them these things to the apostles. And these words seems to them like idle tales. Mm. And they did not believe them. But Peter, thank God for people that can just believe. It was just not normal. And so the story begins to unfold. As soon as Peter hears it, amen, and also that other apostle that was with him was really John, he rose up and they ran. John was quicker than Peter. John got there quick, saw the stone rolled away, just like the lady said, and he peeked in, but he wouldn't go in. Peter got there a little, obviously, probably... <laughs> From running, he steps in there. He was bold enough. I love the boldness of Peter. Thank God for men who are bold in God. Walked into that temple and he realized he found some strange stuff. Because everybody thought that they had stolen the body. But if you stole the body, you wouldn't see anything. But they saw the, 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 the linen cloth that he was uh, bounded with. Laid right there. It's almost like, you know, it's not like unraveled, but it was laid like he just, he, he just stepped out of it. And then he took the, the, the cloth in his face and folded it specifically, very neatly. Wasn't, wasn't, you know, just, it, there was order in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he begins to show himself. The resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ is the central doctrine of Christianity. So much so that the scriptures have so much to say about the resurrection of our Lord. There is nobody in all of history, I don't care how far back you can go in antiquity, nobody, nobody can say, or could have ever decreed such a divine, make a def, divine statement that destroyed this body and in three days I have the right from God the Father to raise it up. He was going to be the firstborn of many brethren. This is something that Christianity is all about. I want to read to you just there's a lot of beautiful things that took place. I mean, how God showed up. And showed himself to individuals. And we're going to read a little bit as to 
how God himself validates. It's almost like conclusive evidence that he was risen from the dead. you got to be totally convinced in what took place at Calvary and three days later. I realize, and it's sad, grieves my heart when I saw the pictures of those Beloved Christians in Kenya that were that were shot, shot. They're shown. Uh, there's there's some pictures, graphic pictures, and it and all in one room. Now understand this. They were so convinced that they were not, they were not gonna deny the Lord Jesus Christ over their lives because they believed. They believed. Their faith was established. Now I'm gonna tell you this. I'm a. I, I'm gonna be. I, I love you. I love you. But let me tell you something. If you saw some radical individuals walk up in here and say, do you believe? Do you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Boom. Next. Do you believe? He just saw what happened. He just, some of us will say, oh, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm an atheist. <laughs> I came with him. I came with him. I, he, I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> but all 147 of them, bless their boldness. We see it as a weakness, but they were bold. I'll take a bullet for Jesus. I know what he is to me. Yeah. See, if he's not real to you, you next. 147 of them, boom. I'll, would you, would you, would we lay our lives down just like he laid his life down for us? My God. Do you realize the disciples were so convinced, the apostles were so so convinced that every single one of them died martyrs. Every single one of them. Would you die for something you don't believe in? Of course not. Of course not. Paul gets really, really, in, you know, again, understand that the risen Christ is our hope. It is our hope. Had he not risen, then why serve him? Paul even says, well, it's, it's futile for us to do that if he hasn't risen. The fact that he rose again from the dead tells us, assures us that there's life after death. That does, that ought to do something to you. That ought to affect us as individuals. That I'm going to have to stand before God. And give an account for my life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul begins to really elaborate a lot of things concerning this risen Christ and, it, and its significance. It is the foundation of our faith. Understand that we were, you know, when, when God created Adam and Eve, they, he created them, you know, to live forever. Understand, it took them over 900 years to learn to die because of their rebellion and dying, because they died spiritually. Their bodies decayed, broke down, and what was of the earth had to return back to the earth. But here, hallelujah, here's a, 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 the splendor of, of God. Now, now Paul begins to write in, in chapter 15. He, uh, uh, let's just start at verse 3. He says, for, for I delivered to you first of all that which I have also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. In other words, this was foretold. He came specific. He was the atonement. He 
took upon himself. He had to, he had to remember on this past Friday, you know, we shared how, how Jesus says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me for the very first time? God the Father had to turn away because of what, what he, what was being, the sins of the world that was being placed upon Jesus. The holy, the sovereign God couldn't, couldn't look at all of the ugliness of sin. He begins, he says in verse, in verse four, he says, and he was buried and that he rose again on the third day, say the third day. According to the scriptures, see, is that something that just happened? No, this was specifically planned. God's redemptive plan. God, God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit had planned this all out. Planned it all out for us. Hallelujah. It's just not a mistake at all. This just happened. No. It's planned. In verse 5, he says that he was seen by Caiaphas, then the 12. And then after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at one time. Must have been a, a service. But roll up in there. They were, they were locked. They had locked themselves in before for fear of the, of the religious leaders seeking them out. So they weren't out there. They scattered. They were running for their lives. Understand that. And when the ladies came in and told him what they heard the angel say, he is risen, he's, the tomb was moved. You understand that they were excited, but they were in closed doors. They kept banging, banging, banging. So they finally let her in. And then when she said that, you, I, you know, I saw the Lord. That changed everything. Then they remembered what he was teaching them. They've never experienced that before. That's not in the natural. That was hard to do. And so this, this is conclusive evidence. If, if we brought this, I mean, there are 500, there, there was hundreds of people who witnessed Jesus after his crucifixion, after his death. In verse 7 it says, and after that he was seen by James, then all of the apostles. And then last of all, he, see, he was seen by me. Paul says, even after all that, I saw him myself. And he goes on. He says, for I am the least of the apostles who, who am not worthy to be called an apostle because I, I persecuted the church. He still had guilt about that. He, he imprisoned believers, Christians. He tormented Christians. He imprisoned them. He, went, he was there to witness Stephen stoning. But Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. <laughs> Blinded him such he hit the ground, couldn't see nothing. How vulnerable. I guess God had to bring him to his own, huh? <sighs> Blinded. You know, when you blind, you can't see. You, 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 you hum, you know, your boldness go out the window. Somebody help me. Who are you? But by this grace, he says, by, but by the grace of God, I, what I am and his grace towards me was not in vain, for I have labored more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God. He's humbled, you know, but because of his experience, man, he knew. Gotta be, gotta be convinced. Gotta be persuaded. And so now Paul, so he, Paul, Paul talks about the resurrection as being critical, uh, 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 an experience of reality. This is, this is reality for us. This is, this is, we're convinced of this. He goes on to say how this, 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 the, the resurrected Christ gives us hope. Look at it in verse 12. He says, now if Christ is preached that he has been risen from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? We're going to talk about that a little bit. 
But if there is no resurrection of the dead, verse 13, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then your preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes. And we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised him, he raised Christ up, whom he has not raised up. If in fact the dead is not raised. And if the dead do not raise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. See, every other religion that any other founder of religion is still in the grave, beloved. Come on now. We were called to serve a God of the living. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Me, no disrespect to anybody else, but I'm going to follow someone who did exactly what he said he was going to do. Uh. Mm. Hallelujah. It is futile. And then we are still in our sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiful. The most pitiful. It was clear, he says, this is, this is our hope. This is our hope. He talks about how the, the last thing that God, in God's plan that he's going to destroy is death. Verse 20 tells us, now, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruit. See, he is the first one with a glorified body. Amen. We're going to talk about that. What is that? What does that mean? God is the first fruit. He was the first. To, uh, isn't it amazing that his birth was natural, but his conception was supernatural? His death was natural. <laughs> but his resurrection was supernatural. Oh, good God. Death couldn't hold him. I love that song. Death couldn't hold him back. Nails couldn't keep him down. I'm about to bust singing right now. <laughs> he goes on to say, and again, now he says the last enemy that's going to be destroyed. God's on a mission. He's going to destroy death. There is a spirit of death. But hope came in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. He says this. He says, for since by one man, by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all died, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Hallelujah. But each one in his own order. Christ the first fruit and afterwards those who are Christ at his coming. Oh, wait a minute. At his coming, what's going to happen? Mm. Then comes the end. When he delivers, delivers the kingdom of God the Father. When he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy, say the last enemy, that will be destroyed is death. Where death will be no more. Good God Almighty. This is glorified body. What is, what is going on? What is this resurrected body? There were even the religious leaders in those times were separated. The Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrected body. The Pharisees believed in resurrection. They believed, you know, you serve God, you, you know, you're resurrected spiritually, but you know, there's no life after. Well, what good is that? What good is that? What kind of life is that? I ain't buying into something like that. 
Paul goes on to say a little further, you know, if that's the case, well, then eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow you are going to die and you're going to end to exist. It might as well do your party now, party hard. Mm, talking to some people. <laughs> There's a price to party hard. Oh, Jesus. Mm. But then he talks about, he illustrates, what is this resurrected body that we're talking about? What is it? You got to know. We celebrate Calvary. We celebrate the forgiveness of sin. But it's significant. That the resurrection, you know, do you remember what Jesus says? I go, I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you can be also. I'm feeling that. I like the fact that there's obviously some construction going on in heaven because he says he's going to go and prepare a place for me. And he's the carpenter, he knows how to do this stuff. <laughs> And if I go, he says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm coming back for you. Does it make sense? If I'm going to go and prepare, then I want you to go be where I am. So what is this resurrected body? So now we're celebrating today the resurrected body of Christ, but there's a plan in God that he is the first fruit and we are the second fruit. We're going to follow once our our journey is ended here and now. Our bodies, God has a plan for your body. Did you know that? Here, Paul continues to try to explain uh, to, to believers about, about this, this the, the illustration. He's illustrating the resurrected experience. In verse 35, we're still in, in 1 Corinthians 15. We're now at 40, 35. But someone will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? They, they, in their mind, they couldn't understand that. You know I mean, once you die, you decompose. Everything just gets into dust. But did you forget that before you existed, God put a pile of dirt together? Form man in his image and likeness, and then he breathed into his nostrils and he became a living being. So God knows exactly what you're composed of. He knows what we're made of. We know all of the minerals and, and chemicals that compose our bodies. Hmm. But what kind of body are they going to have? 36. Paul gets even bolder. He says, foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. Ooh, hold up. This is deep. It's like a seed. A seed was died, but it has, you know, it germinates. It has the DNA in there and the certain, of uh, uh, the moisture of, and nutrients of the dirt begins and the, 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 the dew of the morning, the sun, the heat at night, you know, it, it brings things life. He starts to share some things. He goes, and what we sow, you do not sow the body that shall be. But mere grain, perhaps wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as it pleases him and to each seed its own body. Then he begins to really get elaborate about a glorified body. So glad you were with us here today. I trust the word of God richly bless you. For the continuation of this message, meet us here, same time, same channel, next week. May the Lord bless you as you increase in the knowledge of His Word.